All right. Welcome to another episode of Tradecraft Tuesday. This is episode 15, Collection and Exfiltration. So um, for anybody who's been here, thanks for coming back. Uh, we always enjoy hosting these, uh, getting to talk with people, see the feedback, um, and really we like educating people. Um, if you're new here and this is your first time or you're watching this after, maybe on YouTube or something, we do these every second Tuesday of the month. Uh, we kind of come in, we talk about some news, we try to do some sort of educational piece and talk about this is what's new and this is what's happening. Sometimes folks jump in. That happens. Yeah. Um, so we get surprise guests. It's cool. Does JV um, not realize anyway. he's actually on board? <laughs> we are finally um, back to finish the MITRE ATT&CK framework. We've been talking about this for like three months about how like we're going to come back and finish it up. And then other stuff kept coming back. So we wanted to actually finish it up for all, all you folks who have been with us. Um, Administrivia, before we get started, if you're chatting, make sure you click all panelists and attendees. That way, not only can we see it, but everybody can see it. That way, it's more fun for everybody when you kind of get to like uh, talk to a bunch of people. Um, and uh, if you have any questions, ask them in the Q&A. That way, we can make sure that we see them and, and get them answered and all that kind of good stuff. So. Uh, Sounds good. Do we ready to jump into okay. maybe some news since we uh, covered all the bases real quick? Because this month has been nuts. Uh, ironically, we did not have, you know, originally planned that the news would follow our topic. We knew we were going to jump back into the MITRE ATT&CK framework. We knew we were going to talk about collection and exfiltration. And it turns out all the news this month has been about ransomware <laughs> collection and data exfiltration. And then obviously uh, going backwards from there. So we've got a lot of talk about in some of the news, Chris, but I'm curious you know, you and John, what's the first one, you know, there was, I saw a whole bunch. Obviously we had the government uh, chiming in on some of that stuff, um, you know, all the way down to more companies, some of the different ransomware families adding other versions. Where do you guys want to start in the news? Uh, so I thought this one was kind of interesting, not because it was uh, super effective or anything, but you know, a lot of times people talk about Windows has all the viruses, has all the malware and the ransomware. And Mac has nothing and Linux has nothing. So, you know, I wanted to throw this one in here that show like that's not always true. Um, there's a ransomware family called Ransom EXX, traditionally been Windows. But um, what people have started noticing in September is that there's now a Linux version for it. So they're going multi-platform. They're trying to get more people. Um, and the article actually called out uh, that this was a human operated ransomware. So we've talked about this uh, before versus like just immediately dropping ransomware or actually having somebody there to figure out whether or not they should drop ransomware, what's the value of the target. What I really enjoyed about this is we talk about where the place is, especially since a lot of our partners are in the service provider you know, business. You see Konica Minolta, Tyler Technologies, et cetera. It's just crazy to see how some of this ransomware is starting to pivot. Of course, the boxes that are worthwhile are usually user documents, file shares, but it's amazing if you get into cloud infrastructure, just how well this will pivot. And that's some of the hypotheses as some of the people in here doing analysis saying, hey, look, yep. looks like they're really good. They've recently developed a Linux variant from their initial Windows version. And kind of the expectation is, why wouldn't you continue expanding? So keep an eye out there for it. But this was far from the only- I was gonna uh, touch a- Oh, oh go sorry. ahead, John. There was something else that was interesting in this article that I, I hadn't seen before. They talked about Big Game Hunter. And instead of encrypting workstations, they were specifically going after servers. Yep. First. Yep. It's an interesting variant, right? Like instead of going after users and their files, maybe you go after like vendors and their, you know, cloud infrastructure and stuff like that. I mean, vendors have more money, maybe. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, I would, uh, you know, big game hunting at the end of the day, if you're savvy enough to run your infrastructure on the back end, and you know, if I recall Tyler Technologies, they had a lot that wasn't just services, they provided a lot of apps, I imagine there was probably a fair amount of Linux stack in there. So maybe it was uh, while they were doing their job talking about what data can I collect and what data can I exfiltrate out of there. I'm sure you got to be somewhat salty to be like, oh, man, I've got opportunity to steal data here, but I don't have the tooling to do it. I, I would be angry about it. Yep. Uh, with that said, I mean, uh, guys, I know uh, on one side of the house, we have ransomware that's clearly uh, starting to ramp up and add new tools. What do you guys think about that press message about 
the Maze ransomware team, claiming they're shutting down its cybercrime operation at the end of October. You believe it? You buy it? What, what do you guys think? I think it's interesting. I mean, so for anybody not familiar, um, Maze, uh, the gang and, and Maze, they, they basically started, they were the first ones to introduce the concept of double extortion, where not only are we going to ransom your files and encrypt them, but we're going to steal them too, so that if you refuse to pay us, then we can put them on the internet. So I'm surprised to see them leaving already and like retiring this early. Yeah, I noticed they've been polite here and redacted all the clients, but this usually on Maze's website that's now finally down, uh, there was all kinds of different companies and they would say, hey, you didn't pay. Notice our topic being collection and exfiltration. Uh, they steal your files first. That's part of the reason that this is just timely for this news. We've seen this before, like the, you know, the Gancrab team claimed to have shut down and then so did Nikibi popped up after them. Um, yeah. yeah, with that said, I no more maze three to four week already I, I i think we'll see some of that source code emerge back out there um we'll see what happens but i think for now we should all just be you know kind of leery of this even if maze does go away i think there's going to be absolutely another follow-on um you know and everybody else is saying hey quit while you're ahead yeah that's some of the truth right maybe the the law is starting to pour down on them maybe not maybe they just can't spend their bitcoin fast enough i <laughs> problems as a ransomware, you know, as a service <laughs> monopoly. So, uh, I mean, the, the article talked about the affiliates, like the maze affiliates. Um, and if you're confused about what we're talking about, there's actually a previous Tradecraft Tuesday episode where we talked about ransomware and how it's a business and how they actually have affiliates that earn commission on deploying ransomware. Um, the article said they're all moving to this new ransomware I'd never heard of, Egregor. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, that's kind of interesting, right? They, they was like, hey, uh, dang, this one avenue for us to make money is gone. Wait, there's this other one over here. Let's jump over there. <laughs> it's funny, right? I mean, I, I would chase it. It's just like we go after business. Um, with that said, you know, it's not just about maze, right? I think is when we continue looking at like where some of this was going, you know, the question is well, how much money is there truly to be made? Right. Can, can you really make bank on this? Is there a really opportunity? And guys, did you see the post from uh, just, a, you know, it was the end of the month. So I guess almost about, almost about two weeks ago, but this was the Revel team. They actually did an interview. Um, so if, if no one had seen this already, and I'll share the URL here in a second, Revel Gang promises a big video game hit. Maze Gang shuts down. So all about the same time. But what's wild about this is Revel, who's kind of Revel, Soda, Nikibi, we've talked about them tons of times. They went on the record and actually gave an interview and claimed, you know, we're about to rank it, uh, rake in a hundred million dollars this year, uh, which is insane. One for them to do a Q and A. Uh, you yeah, know, it's on. Uh, it's on YouTube. The link is on there if you scroll down a little bit. Yeah, I, I don't speak Russian, so it literally made zero sense to me. But hey, if you speak Russian, maybe, maybe there's some interesting stuff in there. I don't know. Yeah, I don't know about you, but uh, I mean, I would have to get really, really special here. Uh, Russian OSINT. And I mean, the video there. had high production content. That's what. I, that's all I can tell. How does their model work? Uh, you know, take it from the hackers first. Uh, look yeah. at this. <laughs> Silly nonsense. But okay, uh, guys, let's keep moving on because I think we've got all kinds of topic. I wanted to bring up one last thing just for the sake. Um, <laughs> it looks like my ad blocker has been updated. Fantastic ad blocker. I, I appreciate that sincerely. We always, we're always we all about updating here at Huntress. Yep. Um, with, with that said, uh, this one here, just great timing. At about all the time that all this news goes wild, we had the, the heads up about hospitals. One, having data taken from them. Two, obviously, there's the uh, PII side of the house, but all the different public sector. Our partners kind of went wild, and this was one of the biggest uh, things that we decided, well, whether it was TrickBot, um, we noticed here we're going to talk about some tools like Anchor DNS, some other indicators of compromise. They have tools meant for moving laterally, worming through the network, stealing your data, creating rules, uh, you know, parsing data out of uh, Outlook. Guys, I think this is just the, the perfect way to begin our Tradecraft Tuesday episode and dive into what we're talking about. Does somebody, does somebody want to talk a little bit about our two tactics uh, that we're going to cover? You know, the first being collection, the second being exfiltration. John, you want to you hit them since you suggested them? Oh, sure. Um, so so we're going to talk about the, the two last, once you're in a, in a network, you want some data, so obviously you're going to collect, and then how do you get that data out? So that's where we're going to go um, 
So first off, we're going to finding and collecting data. And so where do attackers look for this data that they're, once they get on a box, um, MITRE has lots of different uh, categories. So you've got your local system. Or, um, I'll actually share some of these, John. I was going to say, here. yeah. Uh, give me show. one second. I'll pull these up. For those that aren't familiar, what's cool about MITRE and with the reorganization that's happened to MITRE's attack framework, um, they've done a really good job at being able to even breaking down some of these subcategories. So as we're diving in, so while John shares real quick, I'll bring up the screen share. Um, notice obviously, hey, I got onto your local system is where John's talking about. And so John, I know you wanted to cover that it's not just about this ID, but there's a lot of different places you could get. And I know you prepared some screenshots as well. Yeah, for this particular one, we, um, they cover, oh, can you scroll down? Yeah, yeah. Or you want me to? Do you want me to scroll down to a certain part, John, or where, where do you Sorry. want me to cover some of the detection? That wasn't the one I was thinking it was. Okay, let's keep it up then verbal, right? right? We've got a lot of tactics over here in MITRE. Um, yep. you know, among some of those tactics, John, I know you and I have both created tools to do this type of data collection, but at the same time, um, we, we, we have helped people identify these issues, whether it's Red Team or us actually gathering the data. So what are some of your favorite ways of when you're going after local system data? So you've popped on a machine, whether it was a phishing email, an exploit, whatever. Um, I mean, in the beginning, you're just kind of poking around to see what you've got. So like uh, in one of our, oh, you're about to click on that link. You can share that. Yeah, you, you want me to take a look, John, at the, uh, the manual exfiltration? Is that what you're saying? Yep. Cool. I'll bring it up right now on like Google Drive. I yeah. mean, this this is about I mean, as ghetto as it gets, right, John? But this is yep. one way to get I mean, data. Here, here they were. They had, this is actually from a, a cobalt strike attack that we had seen, and we saw we were able to get the logs. And here they've just local system. They're poking around on one of the hosts that they found. They found some travel authorizations, some events, some expense reports. Just collecting basic data, maybe it's got something in there that they're interested in, or it gives them someplace else to start looking for, for data. I mean, Chris, yeah, when you were red teaming, were, were you still using Chris in red team? I mean, I know there's a lot of elegant ways to use the Windows APIs to do it, but I recall when I was doing it, just the good old fashioned dir slash s, right? Or your recursive dir. Yeah, dir slash s these. slash b. <laughs> gotta get that slash b because you want the full path oh you know what i'll bring that up it will uh we'll, we'll do it together right so if we take a look what chris is talking about dir slash s b and the displays all the files in a specific directory and all okay. subdirectories but his slash b says hey use the bare format don't give me any of that fancy you know you know information summaries i just want to know the full path to the where these suckers are located yep. and it's funny sometimes one. tree is a good one do you have tree on that box i i will see i don't think so but we will uh Oh, I'm a liar. Oh, so tree, yeah. for instance, does have some of my data in here. So I've got all kinds of good stuff. The we'll tree is nice because then you get that directory listing with all the subdirectories and you can visually parse it to see like what's where. So we would do a lot of that to try and figure out like, is there anything interesting on here? Um, we had a number of tools that would, we would copy and paste these out and they would automatically grep for all kinds of stuff. Anything that said obviously classified or passwords, users, credit cards, like we had all kinds of keywords that we were looking for in there to try and figure out what was interesting to steal. So John, we, we see here, if I recall this actor, you know, when we're talking about collecting the data, the first part is what, how do you find data in mass? So you could imagine if you're on locally, we'll start looking for your common Excel spreadsheets, your Word document extensions, maybe PDFs are less valuable, but you can also start finding like John, if I recall, databases are pretty, you know, pretty commonly enumerated. You wanna share a little bit about that of what you run into and why that, that's that way? Um, well, all, you have all sorts of stuff. Like if you have internal, you might on your Confluence or some wiki, you might collect data um, that's applicable to all customer or all the business. Um, you've got documentation about your uh, network. Um, one of the things that this actor actually collected was they found a repository of uh, IT documentation. So it had passwords, um, <laughs> VM lists. Uh, that, there's a, a link for that too down farther. 
Yeah, if you give me just one second, John, oh, you were talking about like where you found some of those repositories of data, you know, the ghetto ones. They were actually on network shared drives. Yep. Yeah, I actually had so this up you... here. And so what's funny is even when you're looking at MITRE ATT&CK, you know, obviously we're talking about how ghetto it is to get access and just use the interactive shell. But quite literally on MITRE's guidelines here, John, I don't know if you've even seen this before. It actually says like, you know, why not just use the you know building Built capability in. from command shell? So, I mean, it works, right? And if you take a yep. look at how many different flavors of actors have used some of this stuff, like there's tons of references of where these are commonly used. Um, John, obviously removable media is the same type of thing you could look at, but you were sharing specifically, there was some stuff in regards to not just the uh, information repositories like, um, you know, network share drives, but think about like where people keep sensitive information. Is that where you were kind of going with this conversation? Yep on the network share in this particular case. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and bring up the image here for yep. you, Jen. They, they found on a, there it goes. Yeah, well, uh, you know, clearly we've got internet at the speed of a uh, snail here or Google Drive <laughs> is ready to explode. So there we go. There you go. So in this particular case, they had done a dir list and you can, it's cut off there, but you can see the unk path. So you got the network share um, yep, or cause highlighted, and they were able to pull back a Meraki guest password list, um, documentation about the password reset features of the network, um, obviously a list of VMs and, and credentials from some sort of backup system. So <laughs> these are all ripe for, for information, especially when you're just getting in and you don't know what you found. So you collect this and uh, maybe that list of VMs had a details about and credentials about a uh, finance VM or something or an accounting where you can get in and get more data. So Chris, I'm looking at this backup, you know, credentials.txt. You and I have been doing this a long time on the offensive side. Uh, <laughs> is this changed since like 2000? And I can guarantee even with the viewers that's live viewing right now, somebody in their network right now has one of these shares that they're like, uh, you know, I, uh, I probably shouldn't have that. And I know I shouldn't have it. And some of you are like, no, no, I'm, I'm all completely in IT glue. But I bet money that if you were to go out and do a recursive Duralisk on some of these tasks, you'll go find out and be like, oh, that was in that backup folder that I saved that one time I thought I had a smart error on that hard disk and I made a copy of it. And even though I got rid of the original, I forgot about the backup somewhere. I mean, is that about right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think it's gotten a little bit better um, as tools like 1Password, LastPass um, have gotten, you know, easier and a bit more prevalent. I think it's gotten a bit better, um, but there's still a ton of users out there who have access because they need to do stuff, whether it's like finance stuff or purchasing or whatever. But a lot of times these are not your most technical users, right? And so a lot of times they're not the ones who are using LastPass or 1Password. They're using a text file or they're using the same password everywhere. So I think it's gotten better and stayed the same at the same time. Yep, so uh, ironically, some of our uh, chat people were asking like, where in the heck were these logs coming from? Um, these are some logs we actually captured from an attacker that was targeting a business last month. So uh, a lot of the advice that we give in here is from our own experience doing offense, but you know, sometimes it's just really nice to be able to show and say, hey, we're not making this up. This is from live examples of how they're doing collection. Right. But guys, like I know for a fact, it's not just about where can you find the files? Like that's common sense. And we aren't here to just to teach like the lowest like basics. What about places like there's all kinds of other like really interesting one like email. I think a lot of people forget about how much we email back and forth. And even though you probably should share that document so you're not putting an extra collection, you're, whether it's your PST that's local, you know, your O365 or exchange account, like there's a lot of stuff in there. Does somebody want to grab what you can do? And I'll obviously uh, prepare, you know, some of the, you know, examples of what we could do, talking about like, um, you know, attacker tradecraft of when I do get into email. So do you guys want to share some of that real quick? Yeah, I mean, if you think about the type of stuff that's in email, um, contracts, wire transfer data, account numbers, sometimes passwords, even though that shouldn't be in there, right? There's all kinds of stuff in email that's uh, super valuable and, and emails, plain text. And if I can get on your machine, the same way your Outlook client can download your email from the server, well, I'm on your machine, I can download that too. So 
um, you know, you got to kind of think about that data that a lot of people are like, oh, well, if I'm not emailing it out, yeah, but what if I get on your machine? Yeah. Yeah, for sure. So uh, my favorite, you know, and I, I know this is, this is going to cut deep for some folks, but help documentation at the end of the day is useful for both IT administrators, but also shady hackers. And I can't underestimate how much some of these like simple documents are really helpful. So when I get into your email, it's one thing to just let, let's pull it down. And John, you, you know, like TrickBot, for instance, has a module built into like parsing your email. You know, it'll yep. actually scrape email, scrape documents, and it uses that to forward and spam. But this is kind of a whole other set of like attacks. Like this, John, if I recall, the fancy word that it was given was some of the ruler attacks, mm -hmm. which meant you could create rules within Exchange and O365 to do something. Do you want to, uh, you know, share, uh, you know, maybe what some of these basic rules? I mean, obviously you can read here for people, but we've had a couple partners that have had ruler type attacks that have hit them. And yeah, so- Yeah, I was trying. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. I was just wondering if you could run them through of like some of the rules that are creative, like obviously the basic ones are like, if you get anything that says password, but like, hopefully you're not that terrible. Uh, but there's a lot more creative things you can do with some of this forwarding, especially whether it's used for command and control. Yeah, actually I was trying, I was remembering somebody called me, I think it was earlier this year and said that they had found one of these rule attacks because uh, the attackers had actually gotten in and mistakenly added this person's email address to the forwarding rules, and they were getting all these billing invoices <laughs> from multiple uh, customers of this person. So it was, it was interesting. So yeah, wow. like if you, if you're filtering on anything like passwords or credit card details, that can automatically be sent to the attacker and. Um, I think part of the reason these are like super like brutal is they're just not audited, right? Like, yeah, truly yep. rules are created few and far between. Like they're not there all the time. No one's really going in and looking at their rules all the time. So if I added a rule for you and it didn't change anything about what you see, would you even know? Mm -mm. Probably not. I was going to say there's tool. Yeah. Can you, you can see it in the UI, but you're not, going to do it and then if you actually want to script it in mass there's there's tools to do it but it's not the easiest thing to do so you wouldn't necessarily think to do it kelvin put in chat um you know according to microsoft metrics only half a percent of auto forwarded traffic uh via a rule is legitimate oh wow so, that's a just the majority of auto forwarding traffic. Is, is that a Microsoft metric? They, they post some really like Microsoft awesome metrics. metrics sometimes about just how many failed logon attempts are, you know, truly malicious coming from outside places. I got to imagine that's where Kelvin's pulling that data, but that is insane yep. if that is the case. Um, but the reality is, like you said, who trusts but verify? Like, uh, you know, one, you probably just don't even know, like, hey, maybe I don't use rules or I use the ones that I set up years ago. But I think that's the hard part is nobody verifies these things at the end of the day. So, you know, that's some of the places, guys, where we're talking about, like, obviously, that's a, a really unique way to collect data out of email beyond just the standard stuff. Um, but guys, some of the things that I really enjoy out of this, not just with like the rule attacks and forwarding, is sometimes you, you, you don't want to steal little amounts of data. You want to steal a lot. Like when I think of uh, some of the attacks that we've seen or the ones that get public where they're talking about, I've stole 100 gigs of data or even just a couple gigs of data, like I realized bandwidth is a lot more readily available nowadays, but I'm trying to think of the issues that people tend to run into. Like, where do I store that data? There's actually a process that attackers use that's called a covert store. And the idea is I don't want to just constantly send that data over the wire because I could get caught. So I might store my data locally in a covert store to hide this data, like maybe in folders or the recycle bin or anywhere that someone's unlikely to look. And MITRE calls this out as staging the data. It's an actual like a, a tactic or excuse me, a technique that they call out. And in case anybody is, you know, can't read between the lines, it works just like you would think it does. Adversaries are gonna store it in a central location. They might keep it separate or combine them. Interactive command shells may be used, but also malware, et cetera. And they go on and on and say like, they're gonna go throughout your network, stage the data. And when they get it all done, they wrap it up in a bow. But you know, Chris and John, what are some of the headaches we run into when it comes to actually getting the data out of the network? Right? It's hard enough just to collect out everything you want to steal. But guys, do you want to share a little bit about what some of those problems that we used to run into or what we see actors? 
Yeah, I mean, a lot of it is like, how do you um, how do you get it out of the data, out of the network without somebody noticing? I mean, a uh, hundred gigs is, although it, it used to be a lot, right? It's not so much anymore, especially with everybody using Zoom and stuff. The amount of data generated by endpoints outbound is, is huge now. Um, so it, it's probably a little bit easier now, but it, yeah, it used to be like, you would notice when some host was sending a hundred gigs of data. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I think that's one of those of like, uh, I think about some of the earlier rules that would warn you of, if you take a look at large amounts of data, you know, and that's abnormal, let us know. I'm curious for anybody who's live watching, is this something, do any of you actually have a rule looking for large amounts of ex, you know, out outbound data? Yeah. And it's one thing, like if you're, you know, an MSP, but like if you are, you know, taking care of like, maybe you're taking care of multiple subsidiaries as an IT department, or like in an MSP or MSSP, you're taking care of multiple clients. Do you actually have those outbound rules set as well? Like, I don't even know if this is done anymore. And I think the reason yeah. I question it is, I don't know how effective it ever was. Yeah, I'm trying to think. I, I used to play with Cisco flow data back in the day. And so I would track what protocols were using up lots of bandwidth, but uh, I don't know that I'd ever really drill down and say, oh, this, this particular thing looks odd. Let me look and see what they're they're doing. Yeah, we're getting some good feedback in of like, yeah, sometimes I look at some comparative analysis, but uh, I love some of the comments that are getting really realistic about how there's no um, perimeter anymore. So for instance, if you have all that data that's stored in like SharePoint or some type of like offline cloud service, are you really gonna be able to detect the difference between going from cloud service to cloud service? Like that's not even within your perimeter to be able to take a look at that anymore. Like it's not just within your little, you know, castle wall and you get to see it walking out the castle gate. Um, like you, you probably don't even have the instrumentation in place. I'm not even hundred percent sure, Chris, if I, you know, was to tell you, I'm going after our G suite and I, you know, got into our Google drive. Could you honestly tell me if I took all of our Google drive information? I, I don't know. No, you know? I wouldn't know. Unless Google sent me an email, and even then, it would probably get lost in my inbox. So. <laughs> I probably still wouldn't know. You know? <laughs> yeah, I mean, this is a great example. Um, but size, hey, despite that, like sometimes network filtering and rules, we constantly see attackers trying to compress data. And to be honest, this just makes sense. If I had, for instance, 60 gigs of database data, yeah right? Plenty of like, you know, especially if they're English speaking, where there's all kinds of text compresses really well. No offense, if I'm going to steal your data, why not try to compress it? I mean, and so John, you play with malware all day, every day. What are some of the crazy tools you see get brought in to do compression for, you know, after they've collected it, they're getting ready for exfiltration. Do you want to share some of the, the odd ways you see it? Yeah. So I can actually go back, going back to that, uh, What am I going back attack. to? Attack. Oh, miter attack. Uh, you or are... no, 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 not not the miter attack. Sorry, the uh, the cobalt strike attack. Oh, there was did. they they used initially they used compress or compact, which is built into Windows to do compression. Here they use shell compact to compact a file. What we found was interesting was apparently this wasn't small enough because <laughs> then they went back after the fact and then they uploaded seven zip and use 7-zip to compress it. See, look, yeah. I, I knew that, you know, better compression in 7-zip was worth it for some reason, so. <laughs> I tell you, at Red Team, we used MakeCab all day, every day. That was how we zipped stuff. You wanna share in. what MakeCab does? MakeCab is a built-in Windows capability, right, Chris? Yep. Yeah, so, I mean, it makes, so Microsoft has these things called uh, CAB files, cabinet files, they contain a bunch of stuff. It's no different than a zip file. It's literally a zip file. They just called it by a different name. So when you when you do run make cab, you can specify a bunch of files and it just makes a zip file for you. So um, it was actually, I don't even think I ever knew about Compact, but it was a way to make a zip file uh, from the command line that we knew was on every Windows machine ever. So we never had to upload a new file or whatever. We could just go type it and get our data. Yeah, gosh. I mean, at the end of the day, John, you've seen this, this is a red team favorite, isn't it? It's still what? 20 some years later, uh, I were still running to either make cab or there's a couple other tools like cert util for bringing things in and bringing oh, things yeah, out of the cert, network. Yeah. Um, so it's funny on how some of these old techniques are just uh, recreated again. 
uh, with that said, guys, I mean, we've talked a lot about compression. You're right. Talked a lot about, you know, how they're going to get in there. Even some of the other fun stuff is like when you look at DLP solutions, who try to be able to identify like uh, this key information going through the network. But if you encrypt it up or compress it up, you get around some of those uh, DLP solutions that are looking for tagged or, you know, metadata in files to be able to say, oh, this data left your network. Um, but I think we know that hackers are pretty darn good, at least based on the news that we started here. Maze had a website. Revel has an auction website. So after they successfully steal your data, uh, you know, if you're not willing to pay it, they auction it off to the highest bidder. And then there's endless numbers of copycats that have other places where they're disclosing your data if you don't pay. Uh, but guys, my question for you is how in the world are these attackers going from, all right, I got in the network, I found the data, I put it in my covert store, I finally wrapped a bow on it, I'm ready to take it out, I compressed it, I obfuscated it, but now they got to get it the heck out of the network. Like, where are they going to send it to, guys? Like, where, where are the common places? Uh, one that we see a lot is some other server that they compromise. So there's a lot of crappy servers out there. They're hosting somebody's like side project or like whatever. They, they're old, they have a terrible password, they have no security. And so a lot of times these attackers will compromise those so they can use it as like a jumping off point, right? So instead of having everything come back to where they are that you know exposes them, people might find out who they are, well, they just send it to some other website and they retrieve it from there. And uh, you know that allows them, it, even if the victim just understands like, oh no, I've been hacked and my data went to here, they now have to go call some other company and then other company is like, wait, what are you talking about? We didn't do that. Oh my gosh, we've been hacked too. And then like, nobody knows what's going on and you never get a result. So sending it to somebody else's server uh, works pretty well. Yep. Derek in chat called out. He said, hey, nothing worse than going to an Azure data lake. Like, especially if you're going from Azure to Azure or Chris internally, we use AWS. That is like lightning fast. And you know what? You don't even pay data transfer rates when you're actually going out there. So, you know, it's even better for the attacker to not have, you know, or, you know, good for you who's, ex, you know, who's copying the data out. You're not going to notice the extra bill and good for them because they got it copied lightning quick, which is such a sad thing for me to comment on that that's the <laughs> icing on the cake is you don't pay for your data transfer out of your network. Um, true, true. But guys, like I know that it makes it hard for a victim to identify the final location of the data. Um, do you guys want to talk a little bit about like command and control typically has layers of obfuscations, right? Maybe an LP that has three directors. Do you want to talk about like how the hackers might do it? Because I know sometimes we get uh, questions from our partners that say, look, I know that my data was sent to this out outbound IP. And we sometimes have to caution, like that might not be where your data is. Do you guys want to talk a little bit about redirection and why that attacker might do that? Yeah, I mean, redirection, like it, it's proxy, right? Uh, so when you use a web browser and it hits a proxy, that proxy takes it and, and shoots it off to wherever it's supposed to go. Redirection is basically the same. If, if I'm an attacker, um, I don't want to like hack you from my house. Uh, that, that, that will bring the police to me. Um, so instead I route my traffic through a bunch of places. So I hack somebody and then I use that to hack somebody else. Then I use that to hack somebody else. And so all of my data kind of comes back through that and I bounce it through all these different places. Um, and that way figuring out where I am is really hard because you got to go through multiple layers of different people that were compromised and uh, let's just be straight. These people who were compromised don't have good logs or security or anything. So it's not like they knew I was there. It's not like they could even go back and tell you what happened. Like it's, it turns into a dead end. Yeah. Yeah. I know that's gosh. It's, it's one of those of like, I can think of the law enforcement cases that I'm aware of where even when they start going through multiple countries, you know, uh, if they all stayed in EU, maybe Europol has it, but let's be real. If it jumped from a U.S. data center to somewhere in, you know, Israel, and then somewhere maybe through finally to a Baidu server or something like that, and maybe it was an actor in Iran the whole time, like think of that legal hurdles to be able to get through. So good tactics on being able to exfiltrate that data out. Um, but guys, how's it going? Like I know upload compromised data to cloud storage was something that MITRE talked about. And we oh, all yeah. kind of, you know, we, we kind of covered that real quick. I'm gonna share my yep. screen just a tad, you know, cause it talks about like, look, um, you know, this is common enough to other cloud storage. Obviously it gets its own. Dropbox is one we've always seen. 
uh, yep. or OneDrive, I'm going to just change your OneDrive configuration. So instead of to your OneDrive, it's to somebody else's OneDrive. How would you this know? One's, this one's hard yep. to mitigate against because it's not like you can block it. Like I've seen some people where they're like, hey, we can, you know, uh, pastebin host malicious stuff. We'll block pastebin. And we've, to, we've told people, you know, that's a thing you can do in the past. But there's no way you can't block Google Drive or Dropbox or any of that kind of stuff. Your users are going to, you know, scream bloody murder when they can't do the stuff they need to do. So for attackers, that's a great place for them to upload their data because they know it's always going to be accessible. And good luck trying to call somebody at Google and say, hey, some attacker stole my data and it's in their Google Drive. There's nobody to answer that phone. Yeah, yeah, the support is rough. Um, I'm also thinking about noticing some of these other actors, Hammer Toss, Lunch Money, et cetera, coming through here, talking about the different services. You know, even within Huntress, where as I mentioned, we're already a G Suite company, but on the daily, we're getting somebody like we just, you know, it's, it's almost benefits renewal time period. And ironically, one of the places that we got the benefits renewal, they asked us to sign into OneDrive and be able to pull it down. Like we couldn't even block it, even if we internally don't use it, because we, in a modern world, work with other companies. We couldn't even block this. Like that's just really rough, and it's one of those things that what bothers me is we talk about Empire here. This is a list of software, so this is kind of similar to those that have played with Metasploit uh, or any of the other open source, like you know, penetration testing and hacking skills. These features are built in, like. Hey, come here, download it off GitHub. It's abusing PowerShell uh, and some Python, depending on what it's doing there. And it has built-in capabilities as we've seen on here for, was it OneDrive? Nope, uh, might, must have been Dropbox that has a component for. Yeah, you know, I think it's enterprise exfiltration can use Dropbox and GitHub for data GitHub. exfiltration. Built-in oh, no. capabilities. So that's, uh, you know, you don't even have to be a rock star to figure that out. You quite literally just type in a command, probably something like, you know, exfil space, Dropbox space, whatever the credential is, and then go and you're done. Yep. And yeah, maybe somebody is auditing and somebody is logging credentials and maybe somebody picks that up in like the PowerShell event logs. But more often than not, we see it get missed. Uh, with that said, John, I know we've got all kinds of different ways that go about this, but um, you know, it's, it's not just abusing the cloud storage, right? Um, you know, some places are like, what if there is a, uh, I think people forget, like, technically you could do this the old school physical way, right? Like, do you remember those old, like, Pony Express or Pony plugs <laughs> that you could do? Uh, for those that aren't familiar, let me see if I can find a picture of one of these real mm. quick. Um, you know, that or the Pone phone. Uh, but for those that aren't aware, like, one of the things Chris and I were looking at before we started this uh, event was, you know, there's a lot of devices that people have made it really easy to have leave behinds in your network. Um, so if we go to some of the old, like circa 2012, there was literally this thing called the Pwn plug. And I don't know about you, a big giant box with a Cat5 cable plugged in here. I'd probably call like, you know, this looks pretty shady, but- <laughs> Okay, that, that one, that one does look <laughs> shady. But can you imagine how many, uh, okay, we would get that. We would walk by and be like, no, that doesn't make sense. But how many people in an office would walk by that and be like, Eh, whatever. Yep. Connect the network or whatever. No one would say anything. They don't know. Yeah. Stick especially, it behind your printer. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Exactly. They're not going to see it. Especially because they even themselves, the team, uh, you know, at Pony Express at the time, continued upgrading from the Pone plug into the Pone phone, where it became like, oh, I can leave a phone behind and connect something and have an access point behind to be really? able to enable. So this is a little bit more on the physical side. Obviously, that's not the primary. That's that's not how most SMBs. No offense, like. You don't have your shady Russian actor walking on board, unless you're Tesla, I guess, <laughs> uh, walking into your, your uh, yeah. environment to steal your data. But it is a possibility. Like this is a legitimate exfiltration mechanism. And yeah. how most of those pwn plugs or the phones worked, you would just exfiltrate, plug into your network, and then exfiltrate over LTE or 3G at the time for that old pwn plug. And that was great. And, you know, you've got some of our, our, you know, some of the audiences even chiming in here of remembering like, yeah, add a do not, you know, unplug sticker. I actually saw <laughs> one at one time that was dressed up to look like a hand sanitizer thing, except it was a hand really? sanitizer plugged in. Oh, it's great. But, you know, who's going to pull the hand sanitizer thing off the wall to figure out that it was actually <laughs> plugged in, powered PPOE, uh, you know, and <laughs> powered it like nobody would check that. They, they were years ahead of their time now. Oh. Yeah, yeah, in hindsight. <laughs> um, so guys, um, 
we've talked about this, but no offense, like nobody's exfiltrating large amounts of data over, you know, of, well, I guess 3G, maybe 4G. Um, and we've talked about some of the recommendations MITRE gives, but John, I want to bring up a picture that you brought up just because, uh, you know, we sometimes talk about like how much data is large amounts of data and how quick can it go. And I recall your threat operations team on one of those attacker logs that they recovered, um, you actually had the hackers making notes. So let me screen share real quick. Will you break this down for our audience? Yep, so in, in this case, this was that cobalt strike attack again, and, and they were making notes to themselves. Um, here they uh, made a note that they downloaded 60 gigabytes. So they had a compressed seven zip file oh. that they had uh, X filled out. <sighs> Offsite backup, yeah. shell directory yeah. test beacon to run. I mean, that's almost murder, right? When you're looking yeah. at that, if I recall, John, this actually had one of their names. Like some of them were like- Yeah, it, it had several, Attacker names. Yep, yeah, I remember the, some were terrible, the like Neo, straight from the Matrix. Other <laughs> ones were like, I think there was one guy named like Bob or Andy or yeah, John yeah, or something like that. Something was, simple. Yep. You know, yep. some that were in Cyrillic characters, some that were not. But that's isn't that murder when you're like, what does this look like? Oh, to you, you're nothing more than a footnote, and you mean, oh, I download. Uh, you know, I don't even get the full English there. Download sixty gigs of your data. That's rough. Um, with that said, John, like what are some of the places like from the detection side of the house? We talked about there's threshold alerts. Do you want to tie? I mean, John, you were a network engineer and, you know, a system administrator. You want to talk about like some of the recommendations MITRE actually gave and maybe some of the downfalls some of those recommendations have about like threshold alerts. Um, I saw some of them that were like packet sized related. So. Um, yeah, I was trying to remember and I'm bringing it up real quick. I don't want to bring up one of our slides that actually talks about chunking, but Chris, I think you know where I'm going. On some, um, they're talking about, Oh, that. Oh, go ahead. Oh, I was going to say, okay, go ahead. Uh, now so I know where you're going on our, uh, network triggering MITRE threw up, uh, some of the alerts saying, Hey, look, we want to actually avoid triggering some of these. So, um, people have already made comments in here. Well, why don't you exfiltrate it low and slow? I mean, some hackers are elegant enough and they will, they'll exfiltrate it over, you know, several hours, little bites at a time. And some of the recommendations are, why don't you look at these chunks? If you have a steady stream from an open connection that's lasting for a long period of time, that could be their indicator that they're exfiltrating data out. Um, then again, Chris, you as our chief architect who looks at stateful connections, what is the problem with that strategy for, you know, monitoring that flavor of exfil? I mean, good luck. Like, um, there's so many continuous connections now, especially with WebSockets. You think about all these like websites you go to where you don't have to refresh the page or just snappy stuff is popping in, popping out. There's a continuous connection between your machine and the server um, for that WebSocket stuff. So there's a lot more continuous connections now. There's a lot more data coming from endpoints where you know even 10 years ago endpoints you saw mostly downloading data not so much uploading now there's a lot of uploading video chat um you know all that kind of stuff um imagine if you said like oh hey the attackers are doing this you know they're scheduling it to be automated every hour what about uh applications that are looking for updates every hour how do you deconflict between one and the other it's just so hard just looking at traffic and trying to say from some pattern of traffic, whether it's good or bad. Yeah. So hard. Yeah. It was good. You were, you were talking about the sizes. Like I was looking at the data transfer size limits, like some things use, Oh, if it's less than or 4096 bytes, but heck I remember coding when I do random things, I'll, I'll code 40 hard code 4096 bytes is, is my size to, for data transfer. So that you could have legitimate applications that are using the same thing. Yeah, I, I agree with 2048. <laughs> so gents, uh, you know, we're all about showing, not telling. Um, you know, we've talked so far about chunking data and how it can get cut. But one of the cases that we found with this actor who stole the 60 gigs of data, you know, they didn't go to a fancy cloud service. They had a IP that was, you know, less than reputable. Um, and they also didn't try to use like OneDrive or Dropbox you know, if I recall, guys, was it SFTP, SCP? What would what, what they use? For SFTP, which is yeah, like, it's FTP over SSH. 
So I'm going to go and bring up some slides real quick and let's walk through this guys uh, to help the audience understand what we're talking about on this collection side. Like say for instance, you might be like, well, I don't have, you know, SCP, I don't have many Linux boxes or I don't have SFTP in my network. Well, think about it. If the attacker has access to your endpoint, just like John mentioned earlier about being able to drop 7-zip, they can drop whatever the hell they want. So let's dive into this real quick. This is probably one of my favorite because one, not only do we have the team that still can't spell the word download, they've got <laughs> dowbloader.exe dropping here. Um, we see that, okay, they're running download, you know, uploading it to the file, then they tasked it, upload it. And they're saying, all right, now it's sent home and they, they kind of start walking through. But John, you wanna share, what are some of these DLLs that we're looking at here? And what are they actually dropping into these folders and why is that needed? So in this case, that uh, when you, we got a copy of that DAO bloater to, to take a look at, it, it was a .NET executable. And it used an SSH library, specifically that one, rnci.shh.dll. And that was the core component of the file. So they wrote their own wrapper, essentially, that used the DLL and hard-coded other details into their uploader. They called it a downloader, but it was really an uploader. <laughs> SFTPing files back to their system. See, what's funny about that, it just depends on what perception. If you're getting your data stole from, it feels like that you're uploading your data to their servers. <laughs> but if they're stealing the data from you, they're downloading your data. Yeah, that's that true. silly yeah. how, how ridiculous <laughs> that feels when you got the different persona. But let's dive into that renc.ssh.dll real quick. So I'm going to open a, a tab just long enough to renc.ssh, was it sshnet.dll? And immediately yep. anybody starts looking, you get the NuGet package manager. And so they really were bringing down the legitimate .NET library for, that includes SSH.NET. And as John mentioned, you know, when they would upload this, these are like dependencies, just like how sometimes in Windows you have programs that are dependent on like, you know, kernel32.dll. Well, they were dependent, their DAO bloater was dependent on this SSH software. With that said, John, let's dive in. You, you know, as soon as they got the file in place there, you want to walk through what this uh, foothold was all about that they created? So here they, they, after they uploaded their file, they created a scheduled task to execute the DAO bloater. And specifically, they were uh, SFTPing out this uh, MDF file from a SQL server. And then after it was done, they went ahead and deleted their down bloater and their SSH library. Yeah. Hmm. yeah, that's so this done. this one only ran once, but there's no reason like the attacker couldn't use a, a, a ship task that ran multiple times every hour, once a day at two in the morning. Right. Um, and, and I've seen this before, like we, we even did this at Red Team sometimes where we would have, um, you know, for any given network that we were in, we might have a, a single box or a location on a file share that was kind of like our XFIL folder. And we would just like drop stuff in there as we were like working. And then whole other point in time, something would just kick off a task, pick it up and upload it. And so that way we could kind of separate when we were actually doing actions on the network and when data was being sent. That way there wasn't a, a correlation of data was being sent and what were the connections at the time. So it made it harder for any defenders to kind of uh, you know, connect data going out and us being in the network. Yeah, that's rough. So if I recall, John, uh, you know, so, some of the funny parts about exfiltration, we always talk about in these Tradecraft Tuesdays, the bad decisions that you can make as a defender. But there's some pretty bad, you know, practices that some of the attackers sometimes attackers. use. You want to walk us through this one here, John? So, this is, yep. if I recall, this is, is this dowblode.exe that we're looking at? Yep, this is Dabloader. This is actually the, uh, like I said, it was written in .NET. So something as simple as DN Spy can open it up and take a peek. Um, on the left-hand side, you can see there's a dot obfuscation. So it was slightly obfuscated, but DN Spy was able to undo it. And in this case, digging through a little bit, we found uh, this interesting snippet of code so they've got their text that's highlighted, which has got an IP address, the port number, obviously 22, hard-coded username, and text three is a hard-coded password. And they uh, made a connection using that SFTP client 
protocol and then they were uploading whatever it was passed into it to root some folder downloads. So it cuts both ways, right? Hard coding credentials is a terrible idea, but to be honest, if you don't get caught and you don't have somebody that's capable of reverse engineering, what does it matter? To, to be honest, that, that was a risk they decided to take. So um, obviously we hope that this insider scoop was kind of interesting to see in here. Um, we obviously talked about how this blended in with normal traffic, but at the end of the day, that's kind of what modern exfiltration is about, Chris. And I know there is, you know, we covered some of the basics with just trusted applications, but do you want to cover maybe a little bit more, Chris, about your time? Like there's all kinds of exotic techniques that we could talk about. You want to share about those just a little bit more? And then we've yeah. got a case study that we could run through just to close this thing off. Yeah, I mean, you can get a little bit more interesting and uh, try and use uh, some different port numbers, right? Um, maybe instead of having port 22 for some of your SCP stuff, you'll see a lot of attackers reuse 443. Uh, that way, like if, if I'm a defender and I'm looking at Wireshark, I'm gonna just see a bunch of data that's going across there that I can't read, but that's no different than me looking at somebody's HTTPS traffic, right? It's all encrypted, I can't read it. So there's that. You could also go super exotic and do stuff, uh, exfiltration over DNS or some of these other protocols that a lot of people consider read only. Like for example, when I'm using DNS, I'm making a request for some domain name and I'm expecting to get back an IP address. Well, that request for that domain name is completely arbitrary. So we actually talked about this uh, in the Tradecraft Tuesday we did last month. Actually, I think it was the White Hat Wednesday White, we did last yep. month. Um, Annie Ballou kind of went over a, a paper where they were talking about doing um, exfiltration over DNS and they were using um, these random or what appeared to be random extra long subdomains <laughs> off a domain that they controlled. And what it turned out is that it wasn't just random, it was some encoded data that they were using. And so the, the um, DNS server on the other end was basically stripping that data off and could reconstitute the file based on all these crazy subdomains that were being requested. Yeah, so Chris, I brought up just some of that, you know, the silly arbitrary, hey, parsing, what's your stuff coming across and obviously figuring that stuff out. So if anybody hadn't seen that episode, that's something that's already on our YouTube or in the process of getting to our YouTube. But it's crazy. There's all kinds of these funky DNS type exfiltration. Heck, Chris, I think you and I have even done some stuff over like ping before where we exfiltrated data over the, what is that? We had something like 30 some characters, 40 some characters. I don't remember what it was. It's like yep. A, B, C, D, 26 plus 10, something yep. like that. But it's we just did crazy stuff like that uh, for like CTFs sometimes yeah. where you could like run a command, but there was like nothing on the machine, but you could like cat the key into ping and you could have ping, you know, use that as the payload, um, all kinds of crazy stuff. Yeah, I get it. All right, guys, so I've got a pretty legit uh, case study I wanted to share to end our Tradecraft Tuesday. Are you okay with me uh, bringing into one of these? Yep. And we'll yep. kind of live, you know, wrap up our episode with a, a culmination of these. So I found two articles. Um, they were one I read in October and one, ironically, it's only a couple days old, November 5th. So I'm gonna jump into the October one first. And this is just a great example of like the threats we're talking about when it comes to collection, finding data, moving through your network. Notice here, this is an article from the DFIR report and it has the super catchy title of like, hey, Ryuk in five hours. It's like gone in 60 seconds. But they were talking about how quick that the actors came in. They had the Bazaar malware using the Bazaar loader. They managed to move their way through the network. They used tools like Cobalt Strike, AdFind to be able to do some of the collection to be able to accomplish. And if we follow this timeline, it goes from, hey, at five o'clock UTC, you see the malware is executed. It's calling back to the command and control over 443. Why? You're probably not doing deep packet inspection. They're going to spawn some new processes, inject into um, Explorer. They're going to start enumerating your domain. So keep in mind that's reconnaissance, internal reconnaissance. This is not collection yet. They're going to escalate some privileges using the zero logon vulnerability. Why not? Let's get to domain admin rights. They're going to start some lateral movement. Now they have domain admin rights and be able to move anywhere they want. And you know what they're doing. They're moving through, combing the network, getting an idea what the lay of the land is. As they continue to go through here, they finally make sure they've got access, even if you notice here, lateral movement to the secondary domain controller, to then eventually to the primary or the PDC. They drop their Cobalt Strike DLL. So they waited, they had access using, you know, they don't wanna use Cobalt Strike right away. That's their Cadillac tool. 
So use the tools that are burnable, not your really crafty tools. And then if you see, they continue to go through here, look through where are the systems moving laterally joining and then Ryuk executable is, is done. But we know historically through these and including the FBI alert that we put out that these attackers first steal data. So you'll notice all the other topics we've talked about before, defense evasion, moving around, installing Cobalt Strike through uh, Run DLL32, discovery, notice the enumeration of the network as we've been talking about before, AD find to find more stuff in here, the lateral movement, and they kind of don't really cover in this article some of the command and control, but we've seen tons of overlap in the IP space to the same actors that we managed to get data on. And if you notice, all in all, they shared some of the same stuff, but not even a mention in this article for in, the, you know, in five hours about what data was collected. No offense, the actors themselves behind Ryuk are saying, we're not just in it to only steal your data, we're here to be able to do something much more. Fast forward into November though, two hours left to ransom, and they go even a step further to say, look, we've already covered two cases in this time frame. We're now seeing the major healthcare providers, MSPs, furniture manufacturers, et cetera, and what's crazy about this is this campaign is just very similar. I won't regurgitate it since we're running low on time, but notice the same type of enumeration, privilege escalation, RDP and into multiple uh, systems, right? Using their first, you know, foothold or their beachhead in the network, moving around back and forth. Does everybody recognize some of these scheduled tasks? Obviously the names are just a little bit different than that down below .exe, this one called file, you know, page file, whatever. But we know where this is going, right? This is them establishing their access, getting the credentials needed. Once they've gathered enough of this, I'll scroll just a little bit further. They begin the network enumeration, the lateral new, uh, you know, movement to figure out where they're going to store, where's the data worthwhile. And we go down to the very end, it finally gets to Cobalt Strike. As we showed in this entire episode here, Cobalt Strike is useful for both dropping files, executing files, you know, using the built-in shell to be able to compact files and then eventually stealing it before you kick off your ransomware. So um, I will highlight that you'll see all kinds of stuff in here. Commands ran prior to ransom. And they talk all about like, we stopped Veeam the backups. You know, clearly mm -hmm. they're stopping this to be able to do it. But this situation is starting to get to the point where they're able to not only collect files, but ransom within the two hour mark. And by the three hour mark, complete ransom of the entire environment. So part of our warning for you here today is, yes, it's important, super important for you to be able to uh, you know, identify exfiltration and super important for you to be able to identify data collection. But with a timeline like two hours of somebody getting into your network, you really have very finite time to be able to react nowadays on some of this malware. So part of our you know, pitch here is just be aware, this is what it's going on. As we shared before, like even though you have an incident, you're then going to have to do a forensic timeline or your own incident response company is going to have to do that forensic timeline. We just wanted to reiterate that this is an important piece, you know, at the end of the day that you should be educating your clients against, you should be educating yep. your team members against, et cetera. With that said, Chris, we got one hour or one minute left on here. One hour. Uh, yeah, gosh, I could not do it. But uh, you want to uh, end this for us a little bit with. So, well, re real quick, right before we end, one of the things, uh, one of the takeaways I had from that um, our evil interview article was a quote that one of the our evil actors gave. And, uh, and what they said was, everything ultimately comes down to a shift toward leaking files and not locking them. Oh, I've got that uh, quote ready to share. It, it suggests to me that maybe they're, they're, what they're realizing is ransoming files was cool and but as people are getting better and they're having more uh, and better backups maybe they don't get as many payments just by ransoming people but they get a lot more payments when they say hey we have your data we're going to leak it if you don't pay us so i thought that was interesting it may signal like a shift in what they're trying to do but i guess we will see yeah we surely will um with so, this yeah. Um, thanks for hanging out with us for the last hour. Um, if you have any questions, comments, suggestions for future topics, email us, tradecrafttuesday at huntress.com. We've got a whole bunch of events coming up. Um, we got a workshop with the Taylor Business Group. Um, we are going to be doing a webinar with ASCII on you know stopping ransomware before it starts. This is a case study on Ryuk, what we were just talking about. So if you're interested in that, check that out. Kyle's posting all the links in chat. 
Um, we're doing a tech day with Datto MSP, um, and we have an IoT SSA cybercast. Uh, it's going to be called Deception, Deceit, and Decoys, Hackers Lay the Mousetrap. And for anybody who's attending IT Nation Connect, we are there. Come by, visit our booth. Um, don't hassle our reps too much. You know, give them a break. Yeah, for so, sure. With that said, uh, I think that's going to do it for us. Uh, hope everybody out there is doing okay. Um, Veterans Day is tomorrow in the U.S. So uh, thank you to all of our veterans, past, present, future. And we'll see you next time.